Welcome to lecture number seven. My name is Stefan Eriksson, and for those who just tune in, well, welcome to the final lecture of programming for you are. We're going to be talking about programming languages today. And let's uh, start with this here. So first off, we have a little introduction here. There's a channel, or sorry, a chapter I have added up on the um, site for you guys to read. And let me first be very clear. These slides that are presented here are not a substitute for a chapter. There are certain concepts that I do not discuss here in the slideshow here, which are very, very much included in a potential exam and or reset. So you are to read this chapter or this part of this chapter. And it's actually not too bad reading. I like the book. So I think it's a very good introductory reading to how the whole computer world actually works in terms of well programming languages. So I hope that is very clear at this point. So let's um, turn our clock backwards in time, back to your well, really, really far, far gone. And what we're going to be doing today, we're going to be starting with the historic perspective. So no, no, I'm not going to make a history lecture out of this. I'm just going to quickly build up to where, where we are today, given from where we came from. We're going to go into the programming paradigms, discuss a few traditional concepts, and then end off with the procedural units. Well, what that is, you'll figure out, I hope, right? So let's get going. So starting with the historical perspective and speaking about machine language. So when the whole programming language will actually start, we started with the whole, um, we all started at 10100001, whatever. So basically what you also know as binary language, basically also just represented with ones and zeros. This is incredibly tedious and i don't know if any of you have tried to work with this and this is extremely tedious to write and what actually this happened was this was denoted as the first generation of programming languages so these concepts here will simply just input it into these well <clears throat> to use anastasia's here these machines which were gears constructed by gears and this was also what the start would be to develop what was also known as generation two languages, because you would then translate this into, or well, you would build upon this by building these mnemonic systems. I still haven't figured out how to pronounce that M in front, but let's call it mnemonic systems. Okay. What actually happened with these was these systems here would translate things from this mnemonic language into the machine language such that the computer would understand it. And for us, when we write it, well, it's still kind of tedious, but as you can see these two columns up here, that direction there, you can see how machine language in the first column would have been expressed using this mnemonic language. You can already notice that this becomes one step closer for us to easily understand what's going on. Many of these things here, like LD would stand for load, ADDI would be for addition, and then you have a stop and a halt, and all these kind of things that you would have to know, well, translate that into machine language would make the computer do this and that. All these kind of like basic ideas here were, well, first developed in languages like Fortran or Cobalt, I think it's called, Cobalt. I have never written in these languages and thank God for that because that would have been extremely complicated. Well, at least when we compare to the languages we use today. And when you think about these mnemonic languages here and what they actually do, they, they do of course do a better job of making everything understandable that we already can see. If you again compare these two columns here, it is a little more understandable to see what's going on in column two rather than column one. However, we do have things in terms of, well, how this will be translated by the computer. And these mnemonic, mnemonic expressions would then be translated to this machine language here via assemblers, which are essentially the pre, well, the predecessors to what we know as compilers today. And if you take this whole system of these expressions and put them together, you get, well, what is known as a mnemonic system from which the whole translator there or the assembler, whatever we call an assembly language in order to translate this. This is how the main basis for this Gen 1, Gen 2 programming languages actually happened. And let's dive into the notes here as well. Mm. So 
what it actually happens was it would translate these more, I would call it advanced statements into very primitive statements such that the machine would understand these things, which, well, makes this a lot easier for, well, actually accomplishing anything on a computer. But at this point here, we're not even close to what you would consider a programming language today, such as the one we have shown here in R. What actually happened here, so let me go over here. You still have a few things that actually fell short. So when you were at Gen 2 already, this sounds like I'm talking about Pokemon generations, but I am not this time, I swear. Actually, what you're seeing, you're just seeing a small syntax difference, first of all. You do see that it comes with these small primitives. Okay, make it a little more understandable, but this here was still heavily machine dependent. Well, what do I mean by machine dependent? That means that if I would write it on one machine, taking that code or this, well, language and putting it on another machine was not really possible. It was dependent on the characteristics of the particular machine. So it couldn't be freely moved from one machine to another. Kind of like much what we actually see today, right? In terms of being machine independent. But at this point here, it was still heavily, heavily machine dependent. And therefore, well, you're still kind of short of this whole array of opportunities that we have today. And what you would still have to do at that point, you would still have to think in small increments. So do one tiny operation at a time, like add two numbers, subtract two numbers, then find the sum, look up if it's different, step by step. So do all this in very tiny, tiny increments. So at this point, it was still incredibly difficult to accomplish and would take a lot of time. So this is where you would move to third generation languages. And all this here, there'll be more, um, it was kind of like, it'll come more close to what we can know as software development today. And these primitives that was made became in a higher level such that, well, you could accomplish more things using these basic structures. What actually also happened, and that's also very well described in the book, and I kind of really like this point here, where this first was shown how this would be translated in terms of being machine independent, right? Trying to make people understand that each machine, it, doesn't ma it didn't matter how it would, which language would be the input, teaching a German or English or French or whatnot, it is still universally understood and only small change had to be made for in order to go from, say, German to English, and which actually scared a lot of people back then. And... What you can see here in terms of these higher order primitives that came out of this. So I put an example up on here, which is taken straight from the book. So for instance, this assign and the value, these kind of things here were denoted as higher level primitives. And um, those are the simple constructs for now. As you can maybe notice at this point here, it's very simplistic what I'm talking about here. Also, the book just provides a very general introduction if you actually want to know all these nuances to this here, you would have to, well, a lot more reading than I assigned you. So be happy you don't have to at this point. I'm also, not gonna, I'm also gonna emphasize once again, this is not a histor history lecture. So no, we're not gonna go into the greater details here. Just for you guys to know, well, starting from machine language, we move to this Gen 2 assembly language, essentially these mnemonic expressions, for which now we go into third generation languages. However, at this point here, these translators are known as compilers at this point, which is something you hopefully would later relate a little to, uh, to, which actually would actually look very much like what we actually have today. Now I said actually a lot of times, but maybe we should have counted that instead of Bob the Builders. However, at this point here, there's still, you are actually still short of what is known as a true machine independence. Because while you could just take the language now or your program from one machine, say my computer to your computer, and it could run most of the time, you're still short of it. And the book outlines two main reasons for this. First of all, it is there could still be things in your operative system or these, these structures that have made it difficult, even for two very similar computers otherwise, to understand the same language underlying here. And it also turned out to be not so important at the end. Well, what do I mean by that? That means that it simply turned out that there were other things that was even more interesting because programmers at this time here, when this first came out, instead of just talking about machine and in machine independence, 
they went over to talk about, well, how humans could easily interact with a machine. And this is where the whole rise of the machines kind of thing already came in. And this is what later also sprung off to develop the whole, well, concept of, say, machines being really smart and, you know, developing AI, for instance. Ooh. Which is not things we fortunately do not discuss here, but understanding programming languages is a very good starting point for you guys to also understand if you want to go into AI later. Hey, who knows? That may be one thing some of you would do in the future. This approach that we have talked about here represents, say, a linear scale. We talked about just going from Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, up to, well, what we would denote at some point as Gen 4, right? And starting from being completely dependent on the machine, so we as humans would have to conform with each of the individual machines, it was simply just chained into, well, a problem-solving environment where we just tell the machine what to do and then the machine will do it. That would be super easy and super cool. Right, so that is one thing. However, this linear scale is not actually the way things are happening because you could think that a, while it could have been linear in the sense, there's many different programming paradigms that actually developed well alongside one another. Each of these paradigms we'll be discussing in turn. But for instance, you have to understand that just because you use something from one paradigm doesn't mean you're mutually exclusive to another. You could borrow from different paradigms such that you could take part being, well, imperative, functional, object-oriented, whatnot, each of which we're going to discuss in turn now here. And as an example of this, R, or rather S, which R actually comes from, but R from what we're using in this course is a very good example of this because R being actually a sort of an array language, but okay, now I'm going to specifics, borrows from many of these different paradigms. So let's take a look at this uh, paradigm table here. And what we see here, looking at nice timetable here, you see starting in the 50s with the whole machine language when this first was developed, shortly after the Second World War, introducing Fortran, and then you could see you develop other lines of these paradigms. We distinguish, at least in this book here, between four different ones, functional, object-oriented, imperative, and declarative, each of which we now will discuss in turn. But think about it first. Where does R actually go in all this? That's a good question. Where does R actually go? Like, where would you place R? But where? Anybody who would help me place R on this scale? Now I'm asking actually directly in the chat to see where would you actually put R? Now after you have after you have programmed in R for a bit and thinking about these things here, I have not discussed functional and object imperative declarative, but just maybe you read the book already, but where would you think R would actually go? And I get well, a lot of nice suggestions, even over 9,000, which, well, very valid in the Dragon Ball universe, but functional, object-oriented. And actually, the way you would place S for starters, where R sprung from, would be imperative, I would say. But this is turning into more my subjective opinion. And later, R was developed sitting on the imperative. But as you guys clearly point out here, which is true, it does borrow a bit from the functional but also especially from the object oriented. So which actually, you should actually place R somewhere in between. As I already indicated, R being sort of an array language actually. And just because you can use functions doesn't make it a complete functional language, but a functional language in the sense that it's a function based language, but okay. It is a very functional language in that sense, but actually R is quite hard to place. And we might as well have placed it between functional object oriented but as long as we're not saying declarative, we're okay. I would buy any reasonable explanation for putting R somewhere between the first three. So that's okay, guys. So uh, I hope I've been counting uh, uh, bobs so far. There's been quite a few, I can already tell. And uh, well, with that said, let's continue a bit, starting with the imperative paradigm. And this is just gonna go over in short what each of them actually is characterized by. Starting with an imperative, you can just think of that as a sequence of small step-by-step -step commands. And actually, since this is where everything is sprung from, when you look back at the examples from the mnemonic expressions, you see in these step-by-step -step algorithms where you are, as a user, are developing each of these different algorithms that will then solve the problem at hand. 
If you then turn it around and look at the declarative paradigm here, there's actually some pre-established algorithms in this system, and you're actually just describing the problem to the computer, and the computer then use these pre-existing algorithms rather than you coding them to solve this issue at hand. Of course, there are some problems here. Anybody who can tell me what the problem with the declarative thing is in the way I just explained it, like you would describe the problem to the computer and then pre-existing algorithms would then solve it. Problem, anyone? What do you guys think? Hmm. And declarative in the sense of it, the word just means you are declaring the problem to the computer. That's how you should actually just read it. Well, and uh, as pointed out here by Anastasia, and that is, well, not wrong, and actually correct in this case here, would be you need to have these established pre-existing algorithms first. So the program is heavily relying on these pre-existing algorithms. And before the introduction of logic, simply logic language, this was very, very limited. It got a huge boost after, after knowing how to include logical operations into this, which usually you know, simply just improve the declarative programming paradigm. But again, just to be in terms of declarative, you are declaring your problem. That's how you would actually read it. So I hope also that answers uh, Rose's question from the chat that asks what it actually means in terms to be declarative. So let me know. But with that said, let's carry on a little further because now let's go over to the functional paradigm. And what you can actually think of it here, well, we all learned how to write functions back in lecture two and lecture three. And all these things here, you should imagine that a given function language have already a lot of small predefined functions. Let me give you an example. And this is also again taken from the book. So for instance, this one here has some find sum as the old balance and credits, which is then also find sum of debits and then overall find diff. You see, there's these smaller functions that are put together as input in a bigger function, kind of like a step by step system. And that is how you would think about a functional language. Let me clear that up a little further and put it like this. This is also figure 6.3 from the book, where you can indeed see that you take these smaller sums, like find sum of all balance and credits and debits, and put them together to find the difference. And then as the final output would be the new balance at this point. I'm already out of coffee. That's not good. Coffee break. That's one simple way to express how functional paradigm would actually work. A lot of small pre-existing functions from which you put them together in order well to arrive at your results. Okay, so let's um, carry on a little bit further from this. So there's also, of course, some differences between these. You can already think about some, but let's look at the difference between, say, functional and imperative, just as an example. like. If I would take this previous example we just had, like it would be this example here you see in the bottom right now, and I would express this in an imperative style, you would do it like this here. And you see, I split up into say four command lines instead, and, it, and essentially doing everything step by step, breaking it down into the smallest possible parts that I could express this with. That's exactly how you would do it when we think about it as an imperative style versus say its functional counterpart. Okay, so carrying on from here, that leaves us with the object oriented, which is at least for right now, the most important one today. And what it actually does, it views a complete software system as simply just a collection of different objects. Each of these objects you have collected or created, sorry, consists of a lot of predefined so-called methods which would control what would happen with the object if you do different things to the object. This is very important, for instance, when we talk about graphical user interfaces, like each of these objects being a user interface, say, would have a collection of these methods or predefined, well, functions to it, to, for lack of a better word. What would happen if you click on this user interface, you move it, drag it around with a mouse, you minimize it, all these kind of things here, this is how you could think of an object. All these objects here, well, they come from somewhere, right? 
they come from a so-called class, a class of objects from which each of individual objects are created. You could imagine that a class would create objects and come out with these pre-specified methods and they'll actually be treated like say, well, identical twins, twins, right? And that's also where these things could be called constructors. That is also, well, hence why we have fun with this. Well, you probably seen what happened on the screen right now. And one thing you can think about it. So I got a nice question from the chat. So let me take a moment just to address that. And this is from 007. Still love that part of the name, but okay. Huge Bond fan. But okay. Except Daniel Craig. Bah, the real Bond out there is Pierce Brosnan. Statement. But okay. How does packages fit into this is asked. So one way you can view it here. These packages here could be, well, different functions that are simply added to it here. So it could be seen as a class by some, but just see it as a function in this case here. It's actually a better way to express these packages. Talk, let's talk about that in when we get to procedural units. And again, referring to the chat from Conrad, it's just more like who I see as the real Bond. I played way too much GoldenEye to be able to recognize Craig as a proper Bond over Pierce Brosnan. But okay, besides the point. So. To return to packages, you could probably see this more as a, well, close, falls close to a procedural unit for which we will have here later. So I hope that is fine. Let me know, 007. And meanwhile, sip a coffee. Whew. What would we do without it? Okay. So just to give a nice little example about the object-oriented contra say the imperative paradigm, consider a list of names. And this is also a nice example in the book. So, well, look forward to reading it if you haven't read it already. In an imperative paradigm, you would just see this as a list of data, a similar collection of a data, so data set, right? Where in an object or in a sense, you would think of this object or this list as simply just an object. So an object could be a list including all these names and all these methods to this could be insert a name, delete a name, move a name, sort them. Each of these operations on the object would then be a method where when you talk about an imperative you have to actually step by step pro uh, do this uh, well do this out program this out for lack of better words so it's just whether it is treated as raw data say or just a collection of data versus treating it as an object in this case here from which objects have these different predefined methods which comes from these classes okay hmm which brings us over to the world of traditional concepts. Good thing for you guys here, the way we have been teaching R in this course here, have already shown you many of these tradition, traditional concepts. So hopefully these concepts should not come as a shocker to most of you. I certainly hope so. Well, hmm. it's also a good time to say good morning, Diego, and welcome to the chat and thanks for your input. So guys, Diego, welcome. And let's start with traditional concept. What does a program typically consists of? So actually you can divide this into say three components. First, in the beginning of a program, you write all these declarative statements. And that's where you would declare different variables that you have out there or different pre-specified, say even a matrix, matrix like we have done before. You've seen that when I've created different uh, simulations. The second part would then consist of all these imperative statements that describes these actions that is to be performed on these different, well, variables. And good morning to you, Diego, as well. And finally, it will also consist of comments. Comments to simply enhance readability of this program that you have written. Otherwise, you're going to be in a state that when you first write your program, only you and God will know what it's about. You look at it two months later, now only God will know what's happening with it. That's essentially what happens if you don't put proper comments in there. So considering that, we can simply move forward here and talk about other traditional concepts like variables. I don't have to specify that much because we already did that all the way back in yeah, lecture one, right? So we already talked about different variables, how you would actually how it actually works in R and how this actually would work rather than actually point, you actually would point to these kind of things 
rather than thinking of as creating a new variable. But then you also have these data types. And I may ask you at some point, well, what are the different basic data types in R? And here you would come up and say like, oh, but that's like character, logical, numeric, integer, whatnot, right? And there's also, of course, complex and raw, which we don't really use, but you should at least know the four basic data types that we have in R, right? This will mean by different data types. Of course, with structures, so data structures, well, anybody can come with a data structure. And now I'm just waiting a few seconds until the chat will explode with very good suggestions of what a different data structure would be. Give me one or two or three or more. A matrix, for instance, very good. Matrix, list, vector, triple, yeah, array. There are so many. I got even more here, so a tipple. And uh, I also got one that got deleted, unfortunately, but let's just see data.frame. Yeah, all fine. These are all different types of structures, right? And you typically would distinguish between, say, a simple vector, which only will consist of one different type. But then, of course, you, we also introduced a list, which could induce or include, sorry, different types. So you could have a row of logical, could have a row of integers. And again, then a row of floats, whatnot, right? Could have different components inside each one of them, which is also these different data structures in R. Please visit back in lecture one and two to have more discussion about these things, especially lecture one, actually. Which leaves me now with constants and literals. Well, this may be, well, a literal, for instance. Look at this one here. You have something called an effective altitude, for instance which is altitude plus 645. This 645 number is what is known as a literal. It is simply just a number that is constantly added to this, well, variable at any due time when called upon. The problem with these literals is they're very hard to actually understand, and especially if you would then, say, move some wells or change the underlying structure of this program just a little bit, it becomes even harder to understand, well, what is this 645 for, for a beast, right? And this is where you can define as, say, a constant, which would, from the start of the program, and for instance, here you have final int. This is the way you would actually do it, say, in Java or C++ or C Sharp, each of these different things. And you would simply just define it 645, which then would then be our constant and be a little more descriptive than just this literal 645, which... It's a slight difference, but it definitely helps you understand it better by using, say, constants over literals and how they actually function in R. So, but yeah, we are not just there yet. We got a little a few more things to discuss here before we actually call for a break. And yes, I will take a small break today, duly needed. And what we have first is these other types of statements. We have discussed assignment statements way back in the first lecture where you simply say you assign a value to a name, say 42 to answer, as an example, but we all know the answer is 42, obviously. It's the answer to life, universe, and everything. Try to Google it. Google Calculator will even pop up and say 42 for you. We also have different types of statements, statements that move control around, either jumping loops, skipping loops altogether, or simply running certain programs until a given condition is met. These things could be break, go to, but also like while, these kind of things are also known as control statements. And well, the thing is now I wrote break and go to, but as the book explains, and you should actually check that one out, in terms of this go to that actually can give rise to some very, very nasty and very bad style in terms of programming. And of course, that can be done a lot better. And when you want to solve these kind of things and get this collection of ideas, well, yeah, print, root, word, go to one good example. But this actually gives rise to structured programming, which is actually what we're trying to teach you both indirectly through style, but also the way R actually works in terms of how we're using if else, while, for loops, and so on giving rise to this structured style of programming such that it's more easily readable and it doesn't become this kind of like very messy thing like go-to statements would be. So, oh yeah, don't forget the comments. Thanks for that one. So 
Indeed, comments are also the, a traditional concept, but also there to enhance readability. Like I said earlier, this is also makes it easier for you to remember what you did in order to explain, well, in terms of this course, what you did to us, and also explain, say, other colleagues in the future, your supervisor, whatnot, because comments, they're pretty good. They're pretty important as well. So with that said, there's, of course, many, many other concepts that we will discuss or has not been discussed, but are in the book, for instance. An example could be the concept of overloading. Not discussed that here, but it's described in their book. Hmm. Got some very interesting comments here as well. Like, I'm not here to watch videos about this, but maybe we can do end the course with that in the Q&A session. And I got a question regarding regards with the structure of the exam we discussed. Um, I would save that for the end of the lecture today, then I'll give a few notes on that. But we're going to discuss that in greater detail for the Q&A session next week. But I can also already tell a few things today. Okay, but I will save that for the final part of today's lecture. First, let's proceed your units. And here, well, I actually leave that for self-study for you guys. Ta-da! So at this point here, let's just... Don't... Well, what's the best way to say this? Don't forget to read it. Because procedure units, we kind of discussed that already, how they actually work. But I left that for self-study. Ooh, bad, I know. So at this point here, this is the point to take a small break. And in the break, you can actually just do yourself a huge favor and go and check out the exam folder that is already uploaded in the course. And I can already tell you there will be this. And let me see here. Actually... So first, let me say, now we go on break for the next 10 minutes, and then we come back at 11.50, and go. There are no more Bob the Builders to be counted. How many Bob the Builders were there? There were indeed 14, and MV Vetsum was fast, and 69, well, is a 13, 14, the correct answer. I wrote it also up here for myself, and I also double-checked it. There are 14 Bob the Builders. So, um, hmm, yeah, <laughs> well, you very good, very good, MV Vitam. Um, I'll go on break for 10 minutes, guys. I'll be back at 11.50, and uh, let's think about a nice little prize there for the Bob the Builder spot. See you guys back in a little bit. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to, well, second part of today's lecture. Just a quick uh, mic check. People can still hear me, right? Just let me know. And, uh, well, um, once I'm done with this here, we'll go over this, uh, the questions about the exam. So for now, please wait until we are done. And, uh, well, thanks for responding back, guys. Good to know this is working. I have now a little script we're gonna quickly go through here where we're gonna cover a few of the things that, uh, well, is important that you know, of course, but also just to recap a little bit what we've been, been doing all these different weeks. And uh, well, indeed, never gonna let you down. Uh, it's good that you can admit that you fell for my little trap. Well, anybody else who fell for it, let me know. And uh, well, let's start off. So first, uh, we're going to just dive over in our studio. Hope everything is indeed visible still here. So setting my directory, let's start looking at stacking a pile of oranges or apples or pears or whatever you want to call it. But in this example, we're going to be, uh, st uh, well, piling different oranges. And, um, well, we can do it different ways. So first, we're going to be doing this using a while loop, but also we can use this in terms of recursion. So... We want to stack them so the first layer will then consist of, say, one orange. Well, that's the first top layer. The second one here would then be, well, the number of oranges, one plus. In this case here, you would denote this as n squared. So you see here, consider a pile. The first layer is n times n, while the next layer will consist of, well, n minus one times n minus one orange. So you can see this quickly gets this quick pyramid shape. The way we can do it here is first, of course, when we write our function, of course, we declare what the input to be. We just call this n. 
And then of course, what goes in the function here? Well, we have that if we start with the number of oranges being one, and then we can say, okay, while the number that we input is larger than one, we will then get the number of oranges be, well, the number one that we defined here plus n squared. And then it will go again to the next number all the way until we go down and hit one because this while loop will continue running until we reach the number one. Of course, you can do this in a for loop, which, well, try it out, guys. It may be a very good idea. So we can, of course, just run this function here. So first initialize the function. Then I can go in and say count oranges. Let's go try it out. And let's see, we want to do this with five. How many oranges are there in a stack with five layers? Well, there's going to be 55 oranges. Okay, so let's just be clear here in terms of these loops and for loops here from uh, T.S. Yuk in the chat. That's very possible. I'll wait and let Diego further explain that one, but it's very possible to do. And uh, I'll just leave you with that for now. This is the version, version using a while loop. We can of course also do this using recursion, which makes it a little more compact, of course. And remember with recursion, we have of course an initial step. And then of course we have a recursive step. Here we say if it's equals one, you just return one or else, well, in this case, just else, not just or else. Then we will return in these here, n square plus then count oranges subtracted one. And this is where the recursive part comes in. Of course, you're calling the function again and again and again and getting will the n get smaller and smaller and smaller until we then come back to our initial case, in this case being n equal to one. So trying this one here, this is the recursive version. I can then go and run this function. And again, with the number five, just to confirm, it will give exactly the same answer as before, which would be 55. So that is a quick example of how you would go using a while version, while loop, recursive function, but you can also do this via for loop. Go try it out. So let's go down to example of regression because that's what we, well, dealt a lot with last week. And you also dealt with part of the assignment. I hope you like this week assignment, assignment six. I really think it's a really fun one. So, but uh, let me know what you think or what you thought of it. But in the meantime, let's look at some ice cream. So. Starting this here, this library in ECDAT, one of the data sets in there is an ice cream data set. And what does this ice cream consumption data set contain? Well, it has some different variables, of course. We have the consumption of ice cream per head in pints. Well, it's a very nice US description. We have the average family income per week in US dollars. We have the price of these ice creams per pint of ice cream, of course, and the average temperature, well, expressed in Fahrenheit. I don't have a converter on me, so I'm very terrible with Fahrenheit temperatures. I just know, well, uh, if you get uh, 100 in Fahrenheit, it's starting to get pretty hot. That, uh, that's all I know. I don't remember when freezing is. Is that around 27, 32, something like that? I don't know. I think Celsius is way easier, maybe because we learned it, but it also in my head just makes more sense, but okay. Let's look at the summary of this data set first. And we're simply just gonna go through very similar steps to what we did last week, but just Again, go over these regression concepts because I can guarantee you, you're gonna hear that a lot more times coming back in your study in the future. Gonna, It's all gonna be one big regression, right? So what we have here, we see the minimum, the maximum and different quantiles, median and means for all these different things. And let's start with a simple linear regression model. Of course, well, starting with using the function LM, standing for linear model, where we're regressing as our dependent variable, the y, as a function of income, price, and temperature. And then we print out the summary of the output. Then we get what we have up here. Now, let me enlarge this a little bit so we can see exactly the call. There we go. And we remember from, well, last week's discussion, these different stars relate to whether this coefficient that you observe is significantly different from zero at a given significance level. So for instance, we see here two stars, and then we go down and see here with two stars, we have this is at the 0.1% level actually. So we would say that this coefficient is significantly different from zero, well, at this given significance level. What does it then mean? It means if the income goes up, the weekly income goes up by one US dollar, in this case, the ice cream consumption will go up by this value. So of course, it would have to go up quite a bit, in a sense like, say you increase by $10, 
then we can move the decimal up a little bit, right? Then you get then your ice cream consumption will go up by approximately three cents. Also, maybe because if you get an increase in income, I don't know about you, but uh, well, maybe I will use my money on ice cream way quicker than others. But suppose you get a boost in your income, it's not ice cream that typically comes first on the menu, although it ain't bad. But suppose it will go up by $100, then for each $100, then you will increase your ice cream consumption by 33 cents, according to this model. And of course, we don't see a difference in the price. So in this case here, well, even if the price goes down, we don't see an increase in consumption. Although we do observe that the, the, the sign here is as, as what we would expect. But another very important thing we also notice here that if the temperature increases, so for each Fahrenheit that goes up, the ice cream consumption will go up with it. We observe an R squared here that is pretty high. Remember what R squared is. It is the variation of Y, so the variation of our consumption, that is explained by the variation of all our independent variable, all the Xs. In this case, it's income, price, and temperature. That's what R squared would tell us. It also gives us an idea about how good the predictions would be from this model. And with an R squared of roughly 72%, rounded a bit, of course, it will give pretty decent predictions. That's what we're going to see here. We can, of course, also get the R, R squared out like this. We saw that again last week, so that's just an easy call. We can, of course, plot the predictions from the model against the actual values we observe to see how close they come to one another. And what we see here, let's go down to a plot. Now we enlarge the plot a little bit. I hope everybody can see it here. We see these dots, which are the predicted values on the x-axis. So that's what our model would predict versus the actual observed values in the data set. If we don't see what the correlation here is, well, we see a correlation of, say, roughly 85%. That's pretty high. But even better, we can also depict this using a nice little 45 degree line. Of course, had the predictions been absolutely perfect, all these dots would line up perfectly on this line. It's not the case, but it's still pretty good. And of course, we can look whether these residuals are normally distributed. Well, what do we observe here from this normal QQ plot? Not bad, but not awesome either. So it's on the way there, but not complete awesome yet. So we could also go in and make a nice little, well, histogram plot and simply plot the normal bell curve. You have practiced that a lot. But I'm not doing it here. I'm just using this for the normal QQ plot, so this quantile quantile plot. Well, of course, we plot the theoretical quantiles against these observed quantiles and see whether they actually map out to each other. That was a quick example of for the ice cream consumption. I, I knew I already had to import a nice little ice cream example here. I found it very important. But I do have another example for you here. We'll be using some medical expenditure data set instead, instead of just ice cream consumption. So let's look at for demand for medical care. And here we have, uh, of course, some different variables. We're not talking ice cream consumption anymore, but we do observe that we have annual medical expenditures. Again, this is a nice little US data set. So this is expressed in US dollars. We have individual deductible plans. We also have what the, what the co-insurance rate is. We have the well incentive payments here in logs. We have some physical limitations, the number of chronic diseases, and log of family income, and how big the family is. All these different things to see if we can explain medical expenditures. And uh, we, of course, can also put in the summary for this, just like we did before. So we see this, the data set with a lot more variables than before. Nice little overview. But of course, what is more interesting for us here is how we would actually conduct this linear regression in R. We're going to do the same as again, and now we're going to estimate this linear model where we relate the medical expenditures to all these different independent variables. Let's check a look what we actually get out of this. Let's make more space for this one here so we can see everything. There we go. Now, just to go quickly over what we observe here, we're just checking for stars. We're making this a little simplistic, right? But let's look at this. We figure out that if your health is not great, so fair or poor, so the worse your health is, technically, the more medical expenditure you have. That makes sense. So, so, well, significant at any given level in this case here. Three stars, well, practically zero. What do we also observe? If your number of physical limitations go up, you have higher medical expenditures. Makes sense. The number of diseases you have, same here. They're also the same. The family, uh, the well, 
the income level of the family, if that goes up, you also have higher medical expenditures. I would also go to that making sense. And what do we otherwise have here? Let's see with the last one here, child, yes. So I expect that's whether you have children less than 18. In this case, as data set says here, if that is the case, we see a dot, which means it's significant here at the 5% level. Oh, sorry, 10% level, my bad. So all these things here, well, they make sense. I think so. But this also just to go quickly over it. But one thing you will notice very quickly, how good predictions would this model make actually? Not very good. Why? Because the R square is actually really low. It's not even 4% in this case. So let's take a look at that. Let's look at these residuals first, the QQ plot, just like before. Maybe I should make more space before I do this. Let's run this again. There we go. When I look at this normal QQ plot, does this look normally distributed to you? I hope the answer will be a fat no, because, well, that's the case, it's a no. So. We can also just look at the R square again. We pick it out from before. It's still around 4%. That didn't change, of course. So we know that the predictions would be pretty poor. But we are, nevertheless, we're going to look at this plot again, just like with the ice cream example, and also the correlation between the predicted values and the actual values. We see the correlation here is not even 20%. And we also see here that these dots here, they're really, really far off. Like, you do have what we know as outliers. Hopefully I don't have to explain the concept of outliers, but just to acknowledge a few, we got one up here, and we can also say that these up here are outliers as well. Now, let's go into a little more data mining, shall we? That is, what actually happens if we start removing these outliers? So, simply removing this from the sample and say, well, they're outliers anyway, so we don't really care about them. Let's model, well, more normal cases. Let me just warn you a little bit. This is what I also said. This is a little data mining. So this is, you should be very clear what you're doing here because it may already seem a little shady that you have to remove X number of data points in order to make your, well, data behave. So no, this is nothing to do with you take your data down to the basement, whip it until it confesses. Or well, is it? But let's see. Let's try and move the maximum value. You can do this, so I call it IDX. And then we have a function which max. So it takes the maximum value from this data set, met. So it identifies which observation has the maximum value. That is here of 550, so the number 550. We can then go and make a new data set. I just call it met expand of new, which is the same data set minus this observation that we have identified. So we literally take from this data set, we take out this row corresponding with this observation here. And then we try and run the whole thing again to see whether that actually changed anything. Well, interesting, I think. So let's try it out. We first look at the normal regression output to see if that actually changed anything. In terms of what is significant and what is actually happening here, it doesn't do too much. We see a lot of the same things. Let me go up and see what we can actually find here. Well, age was not significant before, but now it actually becomes significant. Does that make sense that the older you are, the higher medical expenditures? I think that makes perfect sense. So that is indeed, well, I think this is very reasonable. Don't know what you think, but let me know. What we see here, we look at the output. Our R squared improved a little bit. It now went above the 4% instead of just below. So let's look at a QQ plot if that improved a little bit. Let's try it out. This is a QQ plot now. We can, of course, just compare it to the one we had before. That was the one before. Not looking normal. What do we see here? Well, not much better. And thanks for the input here in the chat as well. Happy to see also you guys participating. It's great. But let's look at the predictions again. What do we see? That the correlation here is around 20%, just like before. And we look at the same plot here. Of course, we now are missing this one observation. Now, instead of just moving one observation, let's move a whole bunch to see whether that happens. Now we move everything in the top one per, or in the yeah most outer one percent quantile, as you can see here. So using this which function again, we go in and figure out what medical expenditures are above this or will lays in the outermost quantiles, and we identify them again as IDX. You can see here by printing IDX, it identifies which observations are the most extreme ones we are gonna remove from the top 
And then essentially, when you look at this picture here, we are trying to po poke out all these dots that are laying, you know, as outliers here. And to uh, relate on a comment from the chat, indeed, if there are no stars attached here to the output, let's roll up here again, it is not deemed significant. In other words, if you look at this column for the p-value we have here, if this p-value here, for the purpose of this course, does not fall below 0 0.1, that is below 10%, we do not deem this coefficient here to be statistically different from zero. I hope that answers the question in the chat. Let me know, Yannick. Otherwise, let's go back and look at this picture now where we remove all these outliers in the top 1%. And uh, indeed, Yannick, just look at the p-value. But stars here correspond to the p-value. So a lot of people, they just look quickly at the stars. We will denote, denote here that the boundary being 10%. That is normally what is also done in the literature, but I'm just stressing it for the purpose of this course here. We just use the 10% line. Okay. Let's uh, remove these here. So now we remove these outliers, this top 1%. And now we're going to run the regression once more and see what we get. Let's look at this. What do we observe? Well, some coefficients do change, and we get a lot that's actually starting to become much more significant in the sense that we can show now there's a relationship between the dependent variable and this independent variables here. So we also see here, if in this case, if you are a woman, you have a higher medical expenditure. We see also here if you are, well, in this case, not black for this ratio question here, or this uh, yeah, race question here. We also see a reduction in the medical expenditures. We still see the number of physical limitations, number of diseases, and whether your health is good, fair, or poor. We still don't find any uh, relation here with the education. So, okay. What else do we observe? Oh, the R square is now up at 6.44%. It's better than before, certainly, but it's still very low compared to other examples that we had before. So, let's look at the QQ plot. What do we observe? Haha. We're getting somewhere. We are seeing now this line is starting to rise a little bit and starting to look a little more like a 45 degree line, although we are still quite far off. Let's look at the predictions. So we're going to plot these predictions against one another. And again, we see that the, now the prediction rate is now up above 25%. So we boosted essentially 5% roughly since last time. That's quite nice. But I should duly note that we have just removed the top 1% outliers in this case here. And of course, this is still not a perfect example. So be very cautious if you do this in the future. Now, carrying on, I still got one more example to discuss with you before we go to our final simulation of this course. So this here is actually whether students default or not on their credit card debt, or rather just in, in general, whether you default on a credit card debt or not. I just like to put in the word student also because, well, we do have a variable here for student. And then um, let's take a look at it. But first, I need some more coffee. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to state here, we now have a dependent variable that is 0 or 1. This is also known as a limited response model or a binary choice model. So technically we should use different types of models, but we can still just use a normal regression model that we've done here before. So that's actually what we're going to start with. In terms of why this is not the best way to do it and stuff like that, you will learn that in courses to come. Otherwise, you can always just check one of my lectures and research methods and you'll find in lecture number three this discussion, but it's not important here. I got a question from 007 in the chat, whether it is legal to, or when it is legal to remove outliers. That is a very tough question to answer, and I'm not going to put out any rules here about when that is legal or not. In terms of removing, I'm much more a fan of winterizing. What that is, look it up, but you're essentially changing the value instead of completely deleting it. I find it a step better, although it's still not pretty. So that's one thing I'm going to say about it here. Now, let's look at a dependent variable. So first, what do we have of this data set? So now we have the default data set. Let's look at it. We see that here that our dependent variable is, is uh, denoted as yes, no. So let's first change it into a numeric variable so we can actually, well, use it. 
So the way we do that is just using as numeric of this default here. So let's just change that first, because now we can put it in our regression model just like before. For just attaching a little more meaning to this type of model, we actually call this a linear probability model, because now our dependent variable is a binary or a dummy, 0, 1. 1 if you have, well, in this case, defaulted on your depth, and 0 if you have not. And now the interpretation can just be readily being percentages. So it increases by percent, for instance. That's one way we can do it, of course. But I would like to stress once again, there are some issues with this. We have an issue in terms of this being highly heteroscedastic. Not something you should know much more about here, but just need to know it. And when you use a linear probability model like this, if you make any predictions from this, you risk that this, these predictions fall outside the zero one interval. Why is that so important? Well, does it make sense that predictions or percentages fall outside zero one? No, it does not. You learned all this in probability theory, right? So let's just assume you all know this. So you're going to deal with this later. One fix for this is to be applying different types of model known as logit or profit. I'm just going to try and do it here. We're not going to work all the itty gritty details and all, you know, the theoretical foundation for why to do this. But this is just to show that you have a package here called generalized linear models in uh, R from where you can use one of these models here. In this case here, this is how the command would look in order to change to one of such models. OK. What we do observe, if you are a student up here, what do we see? We see now that there's a negative coefficient, so and it's significant. The p-value here is actually below 1%. So we say that this coefficient attached to student is significantly different from zero. And if you are a student, you are in this case here less likely to default on your credit card debt. Interesting, interesting. Okay, I learned something today. I would have thought differently. But okay. This is just to show what is out there and what will come later. So hopefully just a simple code that I presented here and a simple explanation you also would, at least so you will hear about the future, be like, hmm, I heard about this before. So for this here, this is just how to go with this in the future. And now we're going to go to our final thing for the script, which is our final simulation exp uh, experiment. So looking at the final thing here, what are we going to do? We're going to play some basketball. We're going to shoot a lot of basketballs. What are we going to do? Suppose now you're a basketball player, because we are totally... Uh, uh, oh, a question first in the chat I'd like to take first. There's asked from Jordi whether estimate value is still useful if there are no stars. And well, the short answer, in my opinion, is a yes. But the discussion for whether why this is the case is a much longer one we're not taking here. OK, so sometimes and this is also something related to the day you're writing your thesis, be bachelor or master. Please note that no results, i.e. insignificant results, are also results. I cannot stress this enough. If you want to have these writing tips in terms of this, there's a video on my channel regarding this as well. But for the purpose here, my answer is short theory is, well, they're still useful. Because they're just telling there's no relation, for instance. But that's the short answer to this. Okay, and um, let's go over and shoot some basketballs. You're now a basketball player. You have a 50-50 chance of hitting. That wouldn't make you a pro. I think it should be quite much higher. But we're taking shots, 20 shots at a time. And the question is, what is the probability with a 50-50% success rate that within these 20 shots, you will hit five in a row? Okay, what's the, what's the, what's the probability of that? Anybody want to take a wild guess? Throw it in the chat right now before we actually start running this. We're going to simulate this 10,000 times. So 10,000 times we are going to, well, shoot these 20 balls. And yes, while 14 might be a cool answer here, maybe it's true. Let's put that in. That's a valid, uh, valid chance. Same number as Bob the Builders, right? So 14% is the first go. Anybody else? In the meantime, I show actually three ways here to fill out this matrix. 
to fill out this matrix here where you're taking these, well, shots. Okay. And we got also, let me see here. So I got some questions here uh, from t -Shirk. I'm sorry that your uh, thing got uh, canceled out, but let me read it out. 3.125 is his uh, guess here. That That is your probability of hitting five in a row, or in this case. And uh, well, let me see here. The first thing we can do, we define a matrix from which we draw random numbers from this binomial distributions. We have a 50-50 chance, so we can set the probability P here. Size is in this case here one. And we have, of course, here the number here is the number of simulations times the number of shots. So in the easiest way to do it here, you define this matrix. Well, first of all, I should maybe define the things that goes in it first. Let's do that first. There we go. Now, actually, let me clean up so this looks not nicer and nicer. Okay, there we go. This is the matrix with all your attempts to shoot, right? So let's look at this here. Each row represents one simulation. So 20 shots. Each zero is you missing, each one is you hitting. And the question is here, for all these rows here, what is the chance of you getting five in a row, right? Okay, let's go back. You can also do this alternative here, but it only works if you're probably into 50%, but in this case, it will also come to the same result. You can, of course, also do this, where you, via a nested for loop, simply move from cell by cell, and basically, in this case, flip a coin, right? So this is also another way to do it. And you instantly just draw from a Bernoulli distribution. So each of them is a trial with a 50-50 chance of succeeding. Well, I also got some probabilities here again from Conrad. He goes from 0 0.003125. But the question is here. Now, I can tell you so far, none of you have hit the correct answer. So again, let me rephrase the question or let me clear out the question here. The question is, you're shooting 20 basketballs with a 50% chance of each of them hitting. What is the probability you can shoot five in a row in the basket? And M. Vetsum, is that 10%? I guess so, because, well, percentage goes well between, well, 0, 100. So I assume 10% this here. Let's try it out. I have here this for loop here that can do it. So we initialize a counter, and here we can simulate the number of successes in a matrix. So this matrix here, we fill it first with zeros, rows equal to the number of simulations, and let's just see, we're gonna fill out this whether you succeed or not. So essentially what this for loop here does for you, we try each of these goes here and see whether we reached our goal. So we're simply just counting whether this cell contains a one, or, or in this case, and, the next cell in the row will also contain a one. If that is the case, then you hit two in a row, right? And your counter will go up by one. You will continue doing this until you have five successes. And in this case, you return it to true and say that you succeeded in this go. In the meantime, I got another percentage here from Rose that is 3.1%. You don't have a lot of belief in me hitting five hoops in a row, but let's try and run this here. So running this here now. I have now simulated this here, and let's see what this frac is. So we count the number of simulations, so we count simply how many times we succeeded. Remember, each of these rows is an attempt. One being a success, zero being a fail. You know, let's just take a look at it, actually. Let's look at it here. You see here, all the ones here represents a case where I succeeded, or a case where this basketball player actually succeeded. And each zero is where that basketball player did not succeed. So what do we get? Anybody, any last bets here? Twelve percent. I will tell you that the answer is in this case here, twenty five percent. And uh, well, Anastasia's bet on twenty percent here at the end was actually turned out to be not too bad. So twenty five point fourteen percent in this simulation. And actually, if we would increase the number of simulations here to say 100,000, we would get even closer to this one over four. That's the probability of doing this within 20 hoops or 20 shots. And yeah, this here concludes the final simulation that I'll show for this course here. I got a question also here. Let me see here. Sorry for the, um, for the message here. Message deleted. Oh, no. Oh, well. 
With that said, I would like to thank you guys for your attention. This is the final word for me in lecture seven. I hope you enjoyed the course and well, I'll see you back for the Q&A next week. And well, have a great day and until next time. Mm -hmm.